our mind has to be renewed to the place where the things that were formed the things that we see the things that are manifest we realize they are not going to be made out of something that is visible the kingdom if you will the realm of, of Christ's authority is not a place that is visible to the human eye. Amen. Until faith is activated and the Lord creates that out of something that we can't see. Yes, amen. But understand that when it's being created, we're not going to see it. Because it's made out of something that we can't see. There will be a place and a time that our faith will be will make visible in, in, a, in touching, feeling, seeing, smelling, hearing. What we can't right now touch, see, smell, smell, taste. Here. Moving to the end of the chapter. Talked about you know, the faith of Abraham, the faith of Moses, the faith of the heroes of faith. Verse 32, he says, and What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle. Say, became powerful in battle. Became powerful in battle. This phrase struck me when I read this this morning. And I'm not going to stop here, but it, but it was significant enough to say this. We are weak. He is strong. Yes. Amen. Amen. We sometimes wait until we are strong to engage in the battle. Mm. Come on. But this phrase tells us that they became strong right. in Hallelujah. the battle. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody needs to hear that. That's good. That's good. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. They became strong or powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Some of us feel that way. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Listen. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them yeah. received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us. Yeah. Hallelujah. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. Uh, go ahead. Hallelujah. Listen to the shift here. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. Mm. Mm. We're about to read that something better. What were they talking about? They were. They, he was saying this. We have all of these ancestors, all of this ancient history of miracles and, and faith and mighty acts and, and all of this. We can talk about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We can talk about Moses and Samson. You know, go on down the list like they did. But he said, God has something better for us. Yeah. We are not to model our faith 
after these men and women of God that I just listed. That's right. They are not our model. As much as we would like to idolize them, they are not the standard of faith. They are not the standard because, see, they existed in a, in a time of pre-resurrection, um, let's call it. Listen to what he says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. You were, you were talking about this over and over. The author and perfecter of our faith. Here's the deal. Samson was strong. David was mighty in battle. Gideon took 200, 300 and slew and, and won a battle over thousands. Abraham was called the father of faith. Moses led the children out of Egypt. Joshua led them into Jericho. But Jesus, yeah. he's the one we fix our eyes yes. on. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. He is the model to which we are to shape our faith. Turn to Romans chapter 12. I, it, 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 it's coincidental, I believe, maybe not. From Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. To Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Lord, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation yeah. to know you better. Yes. To know the inheritance we have in Christ. Yes. To not model and fashion our lives. The word conform in the Greek text is actually a word, suschema tizo. Don't get caught up in that Greek word. But what I want you to understand is the word is stated twice. It's stated twice. Be fashioned, it means to be fashioned like or after something. They call it the habitus. It means your physical and your psychological being. All that you are, both physical and internal. Your mind, body, and spirit. It says to be fashioned, but not fashioned after this world. It says that twice. It has that word to be fashioned, then a negative not fashioned after the patterns of this world. Here's the implication. We can fashion. We have the responsibility and the authority to actively and intentionally fashion our bodies and our minds after some pattern. It is not a passive act that just happens or that is supposed to just happen. If we let it just happen, then we are letting it, the world, the what we see, taste, hear, smell, feel, that is what our bodies and our minds are going to be fashioned after. If we do not actively begin to fashion our bodies after something else, what is it that we need to fashion it after? We need to fashion it after, let us turn our eyes upon Jesus. Yes, amen. Yes, yes. It's the one that we can't see. Let us turn our eyes upon the Holy Spirit. Let us turn our hearts to the Father. Yeah. Be renewed, be transformed by the renewing. Or go through this metamorphosis. The word transform is literally metamorphosis or the change that a butterfly goes through 
when it become, goes from a worm to a butterfly uh -huh. or a caterpillar to a butterfly. It goes into its cocoon and it completely changes form. It turns from an ugly caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. That's the word for transform. That's what they're saying. Change, be transformed completely. Get a completely new look, feel, taste, smell. By the renewing of your mind. The, the renewing of not your physical mind. You're not going to be able to take your brain out of your skull, put it on a shelf, take another one and put it back in. The renewing is a renovation, if you will. It's like restoring an old car. You go get this car, it's rusted, beat up. The wheels are flat, tires are flat. The paint's, you know, dull if it has any. The body's in bent, deep dented and beat up. The word means to totally and completely renovate. Kind of like you did your church at one point. Give yourself a new wineskin. To hold this understanding in because the place that you're holding it in right now isn't sufficient. He says, do this so that you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and pleasing, perfect will of the Father, will of God. He's saying so that you can prove. This word prove is like a, 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 an art aficionado or a curator at a museum or, or a horse uh, person who can go and look at a horse and tell whether or not a horse is a good buy. I mean, not everybody can do that, right? I mean, I can go look at a horse and I don't know whether I should buy it or not. I can't, you know, I couldn't tell you. But people that know horses know when they look at a horse what they're looking for and whether or not they should buy that horse. They can lift their, their lips up, look at their gums, look at their hooves, you know. I mean, I don't know what all goes into it. But they know what they're looking at. This is the same thing. He's saying you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's things in your mind that have been conformed to, to systems and philosophies and patterns of this world that you are using to translate and interpret and understand spiritual principles of the kingdom to understand God and his ways that are going to lead you into an erroneous uh, uh, um, conclusion, if you will. It's going to cause you to buy a counterfeit. If you do not go through this transformation, if you do not understand and model yourself after Jesus, yeah. Jesus is the model, yeah. not Gideon, not Barak, yeah. not anyone, not mama, not daddy, not the pastor, oh, not on. the come guy on. next door, not yeah. the president, not anyone, not the yeah. athlete that's making yeah. 20 million. Yeah. It's Jesus. Yeah. He's the one that we look to, yeah. the author. Yeah. Yeah. Johnny, you were talking about 
He took five loaves and two fishes or however many it was and made it into an all-day buffet. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what he's talking about in Mark chapter 8. He took a, he took a little boy's lunch and he turned it into a, a, a buffet to feed 4,000 people. Now explain that to me. Tell me where there's any kind of earthly wisdom or principle or logic that will allow a human being to take five loaves and two fishes to say blessing over it and break it and be able to feed 4,000. Not only that, when they gathered up the pieces, they had more in the end than they had to begin with. Yes. Yes. That's that thing that was created for things that we can't see. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, amen. Amen. Your mind has to be renewed for that to be logical. Mm -hmm. the, there's a pastor that I really like, and he says this, that a, the evidence of a renewed mind is when the, the miracles and the supernatural things of God become logical. When it's logical for you to lay hands on someone and to see a nub or, or a leg grow from a nub. For you to go pray for someone that's not breathing and has been dead for three or four days or it don't matter a year if they're still not, you know, whatever. I guess you can go pray for someone in the grave and the whole the whole uh, cemetery will come up. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any limitation to that. In fact, I know that's going to happen one day. <laughs> so when those things become logical to your mind, you're on the right track of being having a renewed mind. That's right. Amen. Go ahead. It's not logical to our human mind that is skeptical and, and has to has to empirically test everything, you know, go through the scientific method, if you will. And if it can't be proven, you know, and can't be seen, then it can't be real. I was talking to someone the other day and, and he was saying he was saying something, well I can't see it or touch it. I said, Well, oh, you feel that wind coming from that fan, right? Well, yeah. So where, where, where's it, where is it? I don't see it. Do you see it? No, I don't see it. So but it's real, right? Well, yeah. It's a poor example of, of trying to explain the unseen, that we, the thing that we can't see, but knowing that it exists because of us being able to experience it. In Mark chapter 8, verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. <laughs> Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see or and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets full or basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of, of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. Do you still not understand? No, I don't understand how you do it. What, what he was saying was your mind needs to be renewed because you're going off thinking that, that I'm trying to teach you about something, the, the yeast, just because I say something about yeast of the Pharisees and, and, and of Herod, you're going off thinking that, that I'm rebuking you because you didn't bring enough of the bread. Listen, if I can still break that bread, if I can break it, a, a, a five loaves for 5,000 or whatever, seven loaves for 7,000, I can surely take one loaf and feed 12 or a 13. It doesn't matter. That's not what I'm talking about. And he's using this instance to say, you're, under, you're not understanding me. And that's where we have to get to. That's the renewed mind. We have to get to the place where we understand. That's what that renewing of our mind means. Renewing 
our understanding, having the heart and the mind of Jesus, walking with him, knowing him intimately. Yeah. When we get to that point, we'll be like Jesus. Understand this. Miracles in the church, supernatural events, he says, signs and wonders may follow them that believe. statement. Signs and wonders will or shall follow the believers. I ask myself this. Why aren't signs and wonders following me? Why aren't they following you? Why is the church so powerless today? And it's because we do not understand him. Right, boy. We have these things built up in our minds just like I was ministering to you Aunt Pat, that the world and that we have taught ourselves that the one of them is that the Father is using, has given me the sickness. Somehow I deserve the sickness that I have, and that's a lie. He doesn't want any of us to be sick. It doesn't bring glory to Him. Right, and when we realize that, then we break free of that lie, and we allow ourselves then to press into the healing that He has for us. Yes, but when we, have, when we buy into these kind of lies, and our mind doesn't have the right understanding of the Father, then we're just accepting that we're sick and it causes us to be numb to it and not press into it. Another one is this. Well, Jesus was 100% God and he worked miracles and there's no way that I can turn my eye to Jesus, use him as a model and walk and, 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 and see people healed and, and delivered of demons and, and break a loaf of bread and feed 5,000. But I'm going to tell you this, that in Luke, he says, I can do nothing except what I see the Father doing. Right. Amen. And I can say nothing except what I hear the Father saying in the way he says it. Though he was the Son of God, he constrained himself to the limitations of a man. Yes, he did. He did not work these miracles as the Son of God. He worked these miracles as the Son of Man, looking to the Father in heaven for his source of faithfulness and goodness. He knew that as a man, God was good. He was good all the time, and when he saw the Father doing something, he knew intimately the Father, and he knew that the authority that he was given to, to do it and say it here on earth so that what was in heaven would be manifest on earth, he knew that all the power of the kingdom and the throne of God was going to be thrown at that, at that act or at that word, and it was going to be made manifest. He knew that what he could not see in the flesh was being created in the invisible out of something that wasn't visible, but that it would be made visible. Hallelujah. Revivals weren't just intended for A.A. For a. Allen and, and, and Brother Hall and, and uh, whoever else, all these other great men and women of God, uh, uh, Amy Simple McPherson and, and uh, name some more, I don't know. Yeah, Catherine Kuhlman. The Lord didn't just give them a special anointing. What was happening was is they had a special relationship. They had a special understanding of who the Father was. They pressed in, and they knew that they walked in an authority here on earth that was going to be backed by the power of the throne. Yes. Hallelujah. We are no different. He's no respecter of persons. Yes. Why are we powerless? Because we do not, we've lost the understanding. There are some practical things that we've lost. We've quit uh, uh, modeling ourselves after Christ. We say, yes, he sent out the disciples and we're going out to disciple and we're going to tell people about Jesus and the things that he'd done on the cross. But we forget to tell them. Before the cross, he healed people. He delivered them from demons. He raised the dead. He, he made the lame walk. All these things, he made the blind see, he made leprosy fall off. Yes, he did. We teach him about the, the practicalities of, of living a practical Christian life. Loving your neighbor, doing good, 
giving tithe. But where is teaching about how to feed the multitudes when there's a famine? That's right, go ahead. Quiet now, Amen. right there. I've heard, uh, over the last several days, I've heard uh, uh, stories and uh, just on like the internet, on, on, on a news state, uh, channel on the internet, the Drudge Report, they, they have, have different articles where in different places, different occasions, a young, uh, like a baby that is, was in a funeral, raised up out of his coffin and started talking. They were about to bury this baby. In another case, this very same thing happened in a different part of the world with, a, with an older person. I don't know how old they were, but they weren't a baby. Nope. They just raised up in their coffin and started talking. Hallelujah. Listen, I, I'm going to tell you that I don't care where you're at, that baby was embalmed. That other person was involved. That means they had no blood. Their blood, the life-giving fluid in our bodies, was drained from them, and it was filled with a chemical that would preserve them. Yeah. Yeah. He turned water to wine. He can turn formaldehyde to blood. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, come on. People were ra are being raised from the dead. Miracles are happening. The, the, the heart of the Father is being made known, but He wants us to open up and He wants us to see and transform our mind and be able to say, although the world, it sounds rational and it sounds logical that the miracles can't happen, that He's dead and He can't be raised, I'm telling you that I've heard, that I've heard this story. I know that Jesus is the model and He did it. And if he said, I look, I can do it, then I can do it. I'm just going to step out off on a limb, and I'm going to saw it off behind me, and I'm going to say, I don't care if I fail. Father, if I get burned in this fiery furnace like the three Hebrew boys, either I get burned or you save me, either one, I'm going to believe. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Amen. Renewing our mind, that's where I've been, that's what I want. I want to see the revival, the real revival. In these last days, the Lord has been dealing with me. He's raising up a generation that will walk in this revelation of Him. They are setting themselves apart. Let me tell you, it doesn't come playing video games. It doesn't come uh, uh, growing a farm in Farmville. It doesn't come uh, Skyping, you know, or Facebooking all day long. It doesn't come by watching your favorite shows. It doesn't come by, you know, doing what the world does. We're not going to get the heart of the Father if we're doing what the world is doing. Right, I'm not saying they're a sin. I'm saying that if you want the heart of the Father and you want to walk in this anointing and you want to be able to, to know Him intimately and do these things, it, do, it comes with a price, and the price is consecrating ourselves, taking ourselves out of the patterns of this world. Yes. I'm not saying condemn it. Like I said, I don't, I, I'm not saying those things are a sin. There are people that will go to heaven and do that. You don't have to walk in this anointing to go to heaven. You have to believe in him and accept him and confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. There is a very simple and basic uh, a requirement for being saved. But what I'm saying is this. There is a call going out to a nation and a generation of people that he wants you to know him. He wants us to know him so intimately that we know his very heartbeat, that every time it beats, we throb. Every time his breath whispers, we hear it. Every time he moves his little twitches his finger, we're on top of it. And we're saying, I'm ready, Lord. Send me. That's what I want. That's what he wants. So if it's what I want and you want and what he wants, the only thing that's blocking us is our understanding and our willingness to 
Challenge every thought. That's right. Go ahead. That's it. Take it captive. You said you were praying it earlier. I appreciate what you did earlier in taking charge. Spot on. That was just incredible. Taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. Okay. Every vain imagination yeah, yeah. that raises itself up against the name of Jesus. Yeah. That is the battle we face. The battle that we face where we must become strong in battle is not <laughs> battling the demons. They're already defeated. It's not battling sickness. It's already defeated. The battle that we face is battling our own imagination. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. The battlefield of the mind is our greatest battle. Sister Lindy, would you come? Renewing It's a way of living that when you hear, when you say yes, Lord, and you hear it, then you are obedient to it. My wife loves this story. We were told we were, we were listening to a, 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 a woman tell a story about being obedient, living a kingdom, having a kingdom culture. She was talking about this guy who was radically obedient to everything he heard the father saying to him or saw him doing. He was in some restaurant at one time. We'll just call it a Ryan's or something like that because it's what seems to stick. But the father told him to, he, he, he pointed out a guy across the restaurant and he said, go nibble on his ear. <laughs> And he wrestled with that. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> a stranger in a restaurant. He was sitting there, and the Lord said, Go nibble on his ear. And he couldn't put it down. As the story is told, he was obedient. the restaurant. Knelt down beside this guy and just started nibbling on his ear. The testimony is this. The guy broke down and he said, thank you. He said, my wife to nibble on my ear. She's passed away. And what was it? He wasn't a believer. And the only way that he would allow her to talk to him about the Lord was after she nibbled on his ear. And so he came to Christ right there in the restaurant. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Give him a hand. Yeah, that's true.
hey, this is me, go do it. No, seriously, I would do it. But it wouldn't be easy. ears to hear, eyes to see what you do. Short circuit our physical and logical minds that when you begin to talk to us and show us we'll be obedient knowing that you are faithful and good. One day, I wasn't going to tell this, but about three months ago, I was driving to work, and I was running late. We just had a storm, and there was this church that was kind of in our country. We were out in the hill, uh, hills of central Texas, and this church was sent was is on my way. And, they had put up a new giant red sign that was about four foot by 12 foot or something. And a big windstorm came along and blew it and it was draped out across the street. And I, I enjoyed the sign. It was big bright red with white letters and it said Spirit in the Hills Church. I just enjoyed the fact that it was sitting there. It wasn't my church. But it just reminded me every day that the Lord was I passed it on up, and the Lord began to deal with me. He said, go fix that. This is in the morning. I'm on my way to work, running away. Ah, somebody else. Did. Kind of wrestling with that. Finally, it just got so strong. I had to turn around, and I went, and I took some zip ties. driving by the church, and I continued to drive by the church every day, and then the Lord began to deal with me, and he said, I want you to go in there, and I want you to minister to the pastor of this church a word. And I was like, Lord, I don't know these people. They don't know me. This is a Lutheran church. You know? I mean, know how, how, who am I? And I wrestled with that for how long, maybe about a month, maybe more. And one Sunday, I couldn't take it anymore. And I went into the church. I was in my shorts and flip-flops and t-shirt and my visor. That's kind of my, who I am during the week and the week and the week. And I went in and I sat down at the back of the church and she was preaching. There was a female pastor. And 
my heart's beating 90 to 9. And it gets to a break, and she's actually teaching about giving your testimony. I raised my hand and I said, Pastor, I apologize. I don't know if this is an appropriate time. But the Lord sent me here to tell to give your church, you and your church a message. And to tell you that when your sign was blown down, he put it on someone's heart to fix it. And I left a stone out there on top of it. And he wants me to tell you that it's your Ebenezer stone. That thus far, he hasn't forgotten. He's helped you. That was hard for me to do. And when I was done, I didn't wait around. I just kind of made a beeline for the back door. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about the Lord. And she, I, I emailed her a couple days later. I found her email address. I said, I'm the guy. I just wanted to let you know the reason why I left is I didn't want it to be about me. She said, well, I want to thank you for being obedient because. And I said, I will. In, in, the, in the midst of it, I told him how much the sign meant to me being up there. tell you, brother, it was a blessing because there was a lot of discord in the church over that song. Some people thought it was too big and gaudy and blah, blah, blah. She said, it settled dispute in our church. things. 